One who is successful at making access to the source of their breath, which is prior to the in and out breath, they may first experience a faint magnetic light current in either the head region or in the chest region around the area of the sternum. These are two critical points of contact, which are more sensitive to the buddhic light than are other parts of the body which are equally nourished by this light. This magnetic feeling, in addition, can be increased as we do dark Zen meditation many times. It needs to be stressed that once access is made, the amount of time spent accessing the buddhic light is critical, for the number of times eventually leads to a qualitative change in the light's ability to enter into communion with the adept. The more substantial the presence of the light, the more wisdom is acquired. Wisdom, in this sense, is the ability to discern between the buddhic light and the phenomenal world which is immersed in samsara. Some adepts have reported ecstatic enjoyment upon access, which is felt to be fully blissful. What seems unquestionably universal in accessing the buddhic light through dark Zen meditation is the surprise upon recognizing that this inpouring light was there all the while, except that we forgot to turn to it, turning instead to the lightless world of phenomena. Next, it is important to visualize this contact as being just the beginning and not the end. The inception of the buttock light is like a tender green sprout from an acorn which still needs time to mature before it becomes an oak tree. Continuing with the practice of dark Zen meditation is, therefore, very important. But once the light is firmly established, the buddhic light does not depart, even in physical or mental pain. This fact is the seal of authenticity that one has successfully accomplished the most important part of dark Zen meditation, which is its inception. With access, it is easy to understand what suffering really means, including its root cause its cessation, and the path leading to the subjugation of suffering. First of all, suffering is always to be viewed in the context of myself in relation to the body into which I am thrown, which poisons me with the three poisons of stupefaction, malice, and sensuous desire, making it almost impossible for me to understand the Buddha's sublime teachings. Suffering constantly arises because we are attached to corporeal forms thereby losing our connection with the buddhic light. This also means that we lack the capacity to see the non-suffering buddhic light, which ever lies outside the reach of the corporeal. If, on the other hand, we gain access to the buddhic light, then a path is open for us by which to escape from the corporeal labyrinth of suffering and subsequent rebirth into still more states of suffering. After access, as we sense the current of buddhic light streaming into our body, we know that it will be correcting our former errors. Reason tells us that we are in harmony whereas before we were not in harmony. Previously, we were living a one-sided life by adhering to the body, as it were, renouncing our very life, giving spirit. With access, we are now aware of the spirit which quickens the breath and the body. And since we are now a part of this spirit, we can freely choose to enter into communion with it, reaching, in a manner of speaking, the undying other shore, where all suffering comes to an end. After access, the old inclinations to adhere to the body are gradually overcome, but not without struggle, for the adept is still under the rule of many old powerful habits, which have been responsible for past errors. Much of the Buddha's teaching is intended for those who have gained access, but who still need to hold their former ways in check so as to avoid a loss of connection with the buddhic light, which can happen when one strongly craves with sensory. Phenomena One can think of post-access as entering a small stream which goes to the land of Nirvana. Eventually, if one continues following this stream, it turns into a river then gradually this river grows more swift and powerful, carrying our vessel to the land of nirvana and deliverance. But while entry is a momentous occasion, the three poisons of stupefaction, malice, and sensuous desire are still operative from which all manner of deceptions arise. To be sure, 
During the journey, our vessel can hit a sandbar or crash on some hidden rocks. Ironically, the Buddha's way is said to go against the stream, but this stream is the force of habit which leads to repeated suffering. It is not the stream which leads to the undying land of Nirvana. Our human nature is so disposed that without repeated practice, we shall inevitably sink back into our old ways. Thus, getting in the habit of turning to the Buddhic light is of the greatest importance. This is why further study is so important. It helps to reinforce and strengthen our faith in the practice. Further, study of what the Buddha taught acts like a plumb line to ensure that we are making forward progress and not just spinning our wheels in the thick mud of the three poisons and our own personal opinions. The profane who deprecate the Buddha's words telling the sincere adept not to study the Buddha's scriptures are just those people who have never witnessed the Buddhic light during their meditations. Because they have not witnessed the light out of jealousy, they wish those who have entered the sacred stream to Nirvana called Aryans to not study Buddha's words, for his words speak of how to increase communion with the Buddhic light. Ironically, Profane persons stand guard over the sacred doors of the Buddha's library in a manner of speaking, not only keeping others away, but keeping themselves away as well. Such people are cruel and truly blind. They assign a higher value to rituals and formal practices because their minds are turned to the poisons of carnal desire, adorning their flesh with bright colored robes, worthless religious items, and outward pious shows of meditation. However, their outward behavior belies a spirit which is in despair, which cruelly contends against the living Buddhic light, not even allowing those yearning for it to commune with it. It is very important to stress this point. Bad ideas set us against the Buddhic light, restricting access and, therefore, serve to maintain a deluded and potentially evil state of mind which is always running from itself. It is advised that practitioners of dark Zen meditation study philosophy to learn how to dismiss corrupting ideas which can disrupt the mind. It is also advised that practitioners of dark Zen meditation be alert to the modern tendency to distrust religion. We should note, however, that the claims of the religious world should be considered innocent until proven guilty. In addition, science can only deal with the visible world not the world of spirit. Looked at from the Buddha's lofty perspective, our recollection of this anterior spirit is a beginner's insight, but a very important and vital one. It still needs to be deepened, lest the body's old cravings and fears take over again. Otherwise, the body tends to horrify us over time, shrinking access to our true nature, and especially our capacity to commune and assimilate into the Buddhic light. It is very important to spend more of our time pursuing the beautiful teachings of the Buddha, which will help us ascend, becoming more of the universal Buddhic light. 